How are you doing guys? I'd like to welcome you to the third talk today of the day at uh, Zero Waste Festival Ireland in the Science Gallery. Uh, we have a great speaker lined up for you now, who's Trevor Woods, who is a scientist and an artist who has carried out a lot of work in the areas of bioplastics and the different options around them. I'd just like to draw your attention to the fire exits. There's two at the back, the doors you came in, and one here to my right-hand side, to your left-hand side. Could you please turn off your phones during the talk and enjoy? So a big bullet bus for Trevor. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Trevor, as just introduced. Not that you can't tell from the accents, I originally hailed from Cavan, and through Athlone Institute of Technology and the University of North London, I in the past have carried out a diploma and degree in polymer engineering and science. After a bit of backpacking and doing that stuff, I worked in medical device companies which use plastic, I worked in a plastic tray company which uses plastic, and I ended up coming here to Trinity and doing a research master's on the mechanical, thermal, and morphological properties of polyether block amide nanoclay composites. In short, I use fine grains of sand to, <clears throat> to improve the properties of plastic. I then, as you can see at the bottom, I've done some publications and research on biodegradable plastics. And the only reason I give this into the talk, because I give this talk to transition your students on a weekly basis here at term time, uh, is that, I, just to let you know, I kind of know what I'm talking about for the future rest of the slides, okay? So what are plastics? We're used in everyday use, as you can see by the exhibition here today. Uh, plastic bottles, plastic shopping bags, and estimates around the European Union that we use on average around 100 kilograms of plastic per person each year. Now that might be all directly with waste, but your laptop is made of plastic, the keyboard that you use is made of plastic, <clears throat> your mobile phone is made of plastic. So all these things end up contributing to your actually yearly use of plastic. They're used in a pharmacy application. I work in the pharmacy department. they use for storage and preservation. Uh, years ago, when you were using a drug, it would last for maybe three to six weeks. These days, they can last for two to three years in the packaging before they go out of date and can be transported around the world. They're also used in packaging and display. When you walk into a chemist, you actually use the biggest, brightest plastic packaging that you can see. Uh, as that's just advertising. Also, in <clears throat> pharmacy, they're used a lot in drug delivery. So everyone knows they've all taken a vitamin tablet or a headache tablet or some sort of medication from a doctor or nurse, and it comes wrapped in a little bit of plastic. And you innocently swallow that and uh, kind of go, OK, well, the doctor said it's fine. And don't worry, it is absolutely fine. I'm going to go into that stuff a little bit later in the talk, OK? They're also used heavily in medical devices these days. Thankfully, a good point to the plastic is there's less and less infections and spread of disease around the world, and one of the reasons is because of this plastic. However, when they use it in the medical device industry, it costs four times the amount to dispose of that than it does normal plastic waste through your, um, <clears throat> through your bin or composting. So what are these plastics? So they're basically arranged materials that are composed of long change of repeating molecules called monomers. The structure of a monomer is there, and then when you have repeating monomers, it's called a polymer. So depending on the structure of that monomer, you can have different resulting properties. Instead, so <clears throat> this is why there's so many different types of plastics. So PVC is flexible. If you have a carbon, a hydrogen, and a chlorine there, they're used as electrical cable coatings. You all have those in, on your computer at home. And polypropylene is rigid. It's used as pipe, piping and drainage systems, okay? So it all depends on the chemical structure of how, what your end of property of your plastic is used. And there's hundreds of them out there at the moment. It's why it's used and why it's so versatile and why there's so much of it out there. So if you were wondering what type of plastic would say your Coca-Cola bottle is made of, it's PET, polyethylene terephthalate, And it has the number one logo on it. If you take a look at the bottom, you see the recycling symbol. And all these plastics out there have different recycling symbols, so they can be recycled later, hopefully down the waste stream. Number two is HDPE, PVC. We don't like that one at all because you can't recycle it. Low-density polyethylene, polypropylene is very easily recycled. Polystyrene, and then there's others such as biodegradable plastics, which I'll talk about, then CD, CDs or baby bottles. So there's a wide, wide, sorry, wide variety of them out there. But the problem is with these plastics, as you're well known today <clears throat> from walking around the science gallery, is that they're resistant to degradation. So excessive consumption and, pure, and poor recycling via people, remember recycling is still key with all these plastics, generates massive waste. 
one of the uh, facts I found, which is quite old now, is 2006. 2,400 million tonnes of plastic, bottle plastic, which is polyethylene terephthalate, uh, was on American shelves. That's only American shelves in 2006. And only around 25% of that was actually recycled. It takes 500 years for your Coca-Cola bottle to degrade. If you left it out in the middle of a field or in the middle of the sea, it's going to take 500 years for that to degrade. And we'll go into a little bit more about that in the talk. So they're having drastic effects of these to the environment. It's only around 30 years ago they discovered that, so within the world's thermoclines of the oceans, the slowest and biggest ocean is the North Pacific. So what's happening there is, for example, if you throw a bit of plastic into the middle of the Atlantic, around 150 years later, it's going to end up in the middle of the Pacific because that's the slowest part of it. And there's there now a thing called the Pacific Trash Vortex. If you go onto any National Geographic website, they do some very good detailed reports on this. Uh, it's estimated to be twice the size of Texas and to be 100 million tonnes of waste. But it's not just all you know, from the top to the bottom, the sea, it's just floating there as like a biofilm on, on top of the ocean, okay? So we need some sort of alternative to these plastic materials, which take, as you remember, 500 years to degrade. They're going to be taking 500 years to be in the ocean before they degrade, uh, and they're destroying the ocean. You can see there there's a lot of marine animals now that they find um, getting damaged by these plastics. In incidentally enough, one, the 46% of the world's ocean plastic is old fishing nets. But the old fishing nets kind of attract all the other plastic. So there's these like plastic floating islands, as they said, on it. For example, one of these is a plastic, plastic bag, and the other one is a jellyfish. So which here do you think is the plastic bag? Jellyfish, yes. jellyfish is on the right. OK. That's Cool, you can see that, you're a human being. Can you imagine being a turtle? So turtles really don't have a clue because they're, they're, one of their main food sources, very good, is jellyfish. So what's happening out there is that a lot of the turtles are dying because in the ocean they're actually eating the plastic bags, thinking they're jellyfish. Uh, and other marine animals are actually eating the plastic as well. Some of them die, we end up eating some of them, so we still don't know the harmful effects of what that's doing to us and other parts of the environment. So there is an option which I'm offering you today just to show you that it's out there. It's not the be-all to end-all. Still recycling is the best thing that you can do with your piece of plastic at the end of the week. Uh, but there's these options out there and I'm going to give you little presentations of <clears throat> each of them. So what are biodegradable plastics? Biodegradable plastics are a specific type of polymer which break down after its intended purpose to result <clears throat> in natural byproducts such as carbon dioxide, nitrogen and biomass. And these can come from three different sources. The first one is petrochemical sources, such as polyvinyl alcohol, biotechnology, which is polylactic acid, or biomass, which is a thermoplastic starch. Okay? So the first one, I'll give you a little... Forgive me. So to certify yourself as biodegradable with these plastics, you need to go through a certification or ISO standard. And that means that after three to six months in a compost environment, these plastics will break down. <clears throat> now, if you remember what I told you earlier, your Coca-Cola bottle takes 500 years to break down. But if you can prove that your plastic actually degrades within this amount of time, you're able to get a sticker or a logo beside it to say, this is, this is plastic, biodegradable plastic, and then you can sell it. If you don't go through these standards, you're not allowed to sell it on the, on the shelves. So the first one is thermoplastic starch. It comes from things like cereals or potatoes. What you do is you mix it with a plasticizer, uh, extrude it out, which is an industrial process, and they're already out there. If you go to your shop and buy the biodegradable plastic bins, they're made from plas biodegradable plastic starch. There's also biodegradable plastic starch cutlery out there. You'll see them at festivals and, and other, what do you say, eco-friendly stores at the moment. Uh, the second one, is petrochemical sources and polyvinyl alcohol. So most plastics, incidentally, 3% of the world's oil production actually goes into the production of plastics, okay? And through some of these plastics, you can actually make biodegradable ones. So polyvinyl alcohol, the most common known one is <clears throat> probably your, you know, your, your, your tab for detergent for washing your <coughs> clothes, okay? So if you put that in, do you ever put that into your uh, <coughs> clothes, washes away, then what happens? 
it disappears. Do you ever wonder where that goes? So that's called polyvinyl alcohol. And the polyvinyl alcohol polymer, which is, that is made of, is actually harmless to the environment. Because when it goes into the environment, it degrades away naturally after like five minutes. Uh, the marine animals aren't able to eat it, and it's approved by the FDA, it's approved by the European Union. So that's why so many of your eco-tabs are out there. The only problem was is that in the past, people realised that these are actually harmless to the human beings as well, the polyvinyl alcohol, and somebody went ahead and decided to do the Tide Pod Challenge. So please don't uh, go ahead and do that or carry that on again. It actually is harmless. The plastic itself is harmless to the human being, but the detergent inside it is actually harmful to the human. People have ended up in hospital because of an incorrect scientific fact. The next one which I'm going to talk to you about is polyhydroxyalkanates. Now this is the one of the most interesting which I find. Uh, there are certain grades of bacteria out there which are um, available. Bacteria have been around a lot longer than us. They're a bit like us, they realise when the food's going to run out, we better have a bit of a fat source inside us. So if you see inside the, the bacteria which I'm showing you here is the little white cells. What that is, is the bacteria building up some fat because it knows that the food is going to run out at some stage, and when that food runs out, then they better need a bit of energy before they move along. And what they've found through using certain types of bacteria in certain, <coughs> we'll say, production environments, pyrolysis environments, if they fatten up the bacteria as much as possible, if they feed it sugar, in some cases they can actually feed the bacteria plastic, and they kill the bacteria, the fat separates off inside and the bacteria floats to the bottom. And that bacteria, or sorry, that fat which is at the top is actually a biodegradable plastic. And they're able to call that biodegradable plastic polyhydroxyalkanate. There's actually a company in UCD which does some research here with Trinity called Bioplastic. They're doing a lot of work with that. Uh, it's in its infancy. It degrades away within three months, but the problem is it melts at 30 or 40 degrees. So it has its limitations at the moment. You can't use it as a Coca-Cola bottle, but there's loads and loads of research out there that is going to be used for other options. For example, it's going to be used in uh, tissue engineering, uh, drug carriers, um, <clears throat> biocompatibility, as in it's non-harmful to, we'll say, uh, cells inside the human body or your lung cells. Uh, more importantly, in anti-cancer agents, they've actually found some research that it helps kill cancer cells quicker than just having the drug on its own. Okay? So you can see this publication was done in 2017. So the, the influences and applications of this biodegradable plastic, they're only in their infancy. But in 50 years' time, who knows what you're going to hear about this. You could be drinking your plastic or your Coca-Cola from one of these and throwing it away, and it's gone within three months. Okay? And then finally, the last one is polylactic acid. This one's already out there at the moment. So what you do is you take some corn, you dry it into corn starch, and then through a bacterial fermentation process and a lot of chemistry, you're able to make these biodegradable plastic cups. Now, they're already out there as in they're the lids. That's what the lid of your coffee cup is today if you go to the Science Gallery Cafe. And they're actually being used a lot at uh, Electric Picnic and large these festivals. It's become very hipster, which is a good thing to use these biodegradable plastic cups instead of normal ones. I Google male hipster, by the way, and that's the first image that came up. And I Google female hipster, and that's the first image that came up. So there's actually a company in Ireland, down in Cork, they're called Down to Earth Materials, and they are producing and selling these, sorry, they're selling these biodegradable plastic cups. So if you ever have a large party or gathering, please go ahead and do that. I know Electric Picnic done it for a year, and the reason they, done it, they didn't do it the year afterwards was because of the cost. These are still costly. I'll go into that later in some of my final slides. But they're out there. They're in some of the major wholesale, like, let's say, a Tesco, a large store. If you're ever having a house party, try and buy the biodegradable ones, because the more people that actually buy it, the less the cost will be in the future, OK? And it's also that this biodegradable polylactic acid, which degrades within three months in the soil environment, is actually being used in drug carriers. Now, this publication was done in 2000. So what they do is they wrap the drug and the plastic in this. So it's like taking just a little tablet and the drug degrades away naturally inside your body. It goes through the tribicolic carbic acid process, which means it breaks down naturally and you pee it out. Whereas those other plastics got into you, you might have to have some surgery or could cause some damage in the long term. Okay. 
Uh, the most interesting fact I've found recently about this polylactic acid is that there is an Italian company doing research with NASA at the moment, and they're going to be using this on the International Space Station. The reason is, it costs so much money to send something up to the space station. What they decided to do years ago was to send up a 3D printer with some plastic. So instead of sending something up, which costs a lot, the astronauts and the engineers will just make it on the International Space Station. What they found is that this PLA is one of the best ones for printing. Um, so I think it's just, it's, it's nice to know, it's a bit eco-friendly that possibly in the future the whole International Space Station will be just using this PLA. That's if the research goes correctly. But NASA are usually on top of their game about these things. And it's also used in your medical device screw implants. If you all <clears throat> know somebody or you have to go for a hip operation sometime in your life, <clears throat> this is the plastic that you'll be using inside because it degrades away naturally inside you and doesn't harm the human body. So, in short, that's it, uh, the benefits for biodegradable plastics. They're made from renewable resources such as starch and agricultural fibres, and the less use of fossil fuels, as we know, is always a good thing. If not recycled, you can still recycle these. There's no number on the bottom of the... PLA cup that I showed you about, but there ho hopefully will be in the future if some European legislation goes ahead. They break down quicker than conventional plastics, minimising their use to marine and animal life. But still, recycling these is the best thing. Production results in very little carbon emissions of biodegradable plastics. There's publications out there to prove this compared to synthetically produced polymers. Uh, Non-toxic to the environment when full decomposition occurs and more and more promising research applications, as you see in the anti-cancer or the drug delivery options which are out there in the past or in, and the future. And the main disadvantage, of course, is the cost. They will probably be used a lot every day for eco-friendly people such as yourselves who want to come and learn about this stuff, but the cost is just too much. Here in Trinity, we actually have biodegradable plastic knives and forks and cups in all the student canteens, but they cost a little bit more. Does anyone know how much extra it costs? Twenty-five, thirty percent. We're going to need a higher bid than that from someone. Double. Double. Seventy-five. Seventy-five is the closest. So you get, you get it. It's actually seventy-two percent more of expensive at the moment to produce the biodegradable plastic fork or knife than it is to produce the normal standard polystyrene one. So it's uh, again, unfortunately, if when more and more people buy these, the cost will go down. But you need some eco warriors like yourselves to be doing that. Okay. So that's it on the biodegradable plastic front, I hope you got a little bit of education on it. Because I've worked in the plastics environment for so long, I do understand what harm this is doing to our environment, so I think we should need to educate people like yourselves on it. One of the ways that I love how people around the world are doing is, highlight, is uh, artists sort of highlighting the plastic problem. Now, I don't have time at the moment, but if you have time, check out Time magazines, 13 artists who turn ocean trash into amazing art. There's some people out there who pick these things up from the beaches and uh, turn them into contemporary art installations around the world. It's a very, very interesting article. Uh, and you, some of the people on the talk actually do some really interesting TED Talks on how they're going to continue using the same plastic again and again in different installations around the world. Uh, as for myself, I've done a bit of art part-time in NCAD recently. I don't have this uh, sculpture, which is What's Your Plastic Footprint? Uh, again, everything that's in this sculpture is meant, you know, it makes people think, what is your own plastic footprint? You really need to recycle, but if you just stop and think about it every day, when you're at home in your own kitchen, buy a can, or buy a can of Coca-Cola, maybe instead of a bottle. Um, thankfully, I've had this at a few different exhibitions, and it's currently residing in the Recreate Centre. So if you want another Sunday afternoon thing to do, a, reckon, reckon, uh, a rediscovery centre, sorry, in Ballymun, I uh, recommend you go up there and you can see one of my pieces and make you think about your own plastic use. Uh, I was very lucky to get a plastic, I've built a, what would you say, from recycled bottles, a plastic fairy ring fort. It got into Front Square for Green Week last year. Hopefully it'll be in Green Week next year. And it got into the uh, Botanic Gardens for the Zero Waste Festival there as well. So the it's all, you know, everyone knows fairy ring forts. If you want to stop and have a little listen of the, or read, sorry, 
of what my point was is that fairy ring forts have been synonymous with Irish culture for centuries, with the advent of consumer culture in Ireland orientating towards a disposable throwaway society, over 30% of plastic bottles are not correctly recycled annually in Ireland. Falling up in landslide, landfill sites and uh, general environment, will this lead to plastic fairy ring forts <coughs> for centuries ahead within our culture and folklore? Okay, So just like the Time magazine guys beforehand, I really think that art is a way to, to <coughs> educate people about this harmful effects of plastic, and that's what I'm trying to do at the moment. This is one of my installations, it was <coughs> part of NCAD. Uh, this is actually all made from recycled cardboard, all taken here from the college skiff, so it's, uh, it's nice to see that even cardboard can be turned into something contemporary. And my current project is old keyboards. So it's, rec it's estimated that you change your keyboard at work at least every three years. And you think about the dust, the bacteria, uh, the use that it gets every day. In average, I've worked it out that if you have a 40-year career, you're going to use around 14 keyboards, which is quite a lot. So I had a brainwave one day about seeing these coming in and out of uh, electrical waste centres, and I decided to recycle them. I make my own frames at home, back in Calvin, where my, my brother's a carpenter, and what I do is I take the keys and spell out interesting quotes. The first one of them that I have here is called Less is More, which is very fitting for the Eco Festival here. Some quotes aren't worth typing. There's a quite a good one, which I quite like. Uh, end posting, delete liking, insert living. I've actually sold four of those. A lot of people like this these days. Some people just don't like the online world. Uh, I sold some to tourists, Guinness, the wine of Ireland. But the biggest one that gets much, much of a laugh, because we all know them, is keyboard warriors. Um, I, have, I still have a few of those. So that's it, folks. Uh, if you have any questions on the biodegradable plastics, please fire away or talk to me afterwards. And then if you see my Facebook page, you can actually see some of the other uh, recycled artwork that's there as well. Okay? Thank you. It's one question. Yeah, a very light foam type of... Just, uh, is polystyrene... Biodegradable, or how do you get rid of polystyrene? It's one of the worst ones ever. Uh, even uh, to burn it is, is horrible. Uh, try and don't use it. I know it comes in plastic packaging and boxes for your computer. I know a lot of companies are trying to use just a cardboard filling now. Uh, but again, it's, it's on the 500 year mark, just like PET. Okay. Uh, regarding the uh, biodegradable cutlery and uh, glasses in the canteen, wouldn't it be better just to have reusable things like actual glass and actual and metal cutlery? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I always try and sit down and have a cup of coffee, even in any co coffee shop around the city in the morning, and say if I don't have my keep cup with me. The reality is people are in a rush. They're going from one lecture to another. They have 20 minutes to come in, get a bit of a salad, and they have to bring something. Now, the best thing they can do is bring their own with them, but, you know, apart from using the biodegradable one. I think here in the college we're trying to educate people about it because we have a sign up beside the cutlery stating that this is biodegradable, but we also show how expensive it is. Actually, my question is linked to, to that, is how we can put um, a value of the, of the waste, you know, and have some kind of deposit like we have in the Nordic countries or, uh, you know, when you, you can bring back your plastic bottle or any, anything, yeah. and then you get money out of that. <clears throat> Uh, I've seen that a lot in Germany, and uh, one, one part of it, is only, well, the only good part of it is that you see a lot of homeless people come around collecting the rubbish, and then they get you know, a bit of an income off that. Uh, I've, I've, seen it, I've seen it pitched to politicians and stuff here, but I, I, I don't know what the market is or something like that. You need a company who's going to take all that plastic. There is one called Wellman, and they will take only plastic bottles and they recycle it into pellets, but they're sending it off to the Chinese market. But what's happening now is China and Indonesia, they don't want that stuff anymore, so they're, they're going to have to rethink their financial model. The thing is that the company that produced the waste should be the one... Yeah, because all the electrical waste that we get now, if you get rid of a fridge, you know, they have to take the old fridge before they give you the new fridge, so it would be brilliant, but at the end of the day, the, the, there's going to be a, probably a price increase to you or anyone else in the room to their Coca-Cola bottle. 
So people don't like that. If they have to pay more, they're going to lobby against it. Hello. Hello. Uh, my question is about um, the facilities to uh, compost all these bioplastics. Do you think in Ireland, are we ready to process all these bioplastics? Do we have bins um, that collect these sort of plastics? Do people know how to use these bins? I Do think that would be a wonderful right question place? for someone in Enterprise Ireland or uh, <laughs> who would have, you know, a financial backer to start up the company. Unfortunately, you're going to need, like, I, I really don't know what it takes to start a company, say, 100,000. I think it would be a wonderful option, you know, uh, but we're a long way from it, unfortunately. It's not, uh, it's not there, but as I said, the polyhydroxyalkanates, which I explained to you earlier, there's only research going on now. In 50 years' time, you're going to hear about them big time. So hopefully we can in the future. Uh, no, it was a very similar question to that. I mean, where do you produce this biodegradable plastic? Is it possible to imagine a future where the company that now produces all the packaging are going to be forced to transform their production into biodegradable plastic? I mean, it's, even when you try to buy and you try to be zero waste, as zero waste as possible, it's really difficult if the products which are sold are all packaged and somehow. So, do you need, how, how a company can adapt to transform is, I don't know if I can explain that yeah, properly, no, but no, no, I, I know you know, what if you mean saying. what I say, I mean, yeah, it's, it's or you need the different facilities and you need new company that products this biodegradable plastic, how it works. So, one of the major companies in the world who produces the PLA is called NatureWorks. They're actually listed on the New York Stock Exchange and recently their share price has gone up and up because since David Attenborough done his... Ocean 2 film, or you know, Planet Ocean 2, uh, a lot more people have become interested in it, and they call it the David Attenborough effect. So, more and more people are, you know, trying to reduce their use of plastic. So, hopefully, what's going to happen is, but what is really going to have to do, it's not the producers of the plastic. Once they produce the plastic, they don't really care. They've made their money, their shareholders are happy. It's probably, we'll say, the Tesco's, the Aldi's, the Lidl's, all these major chain supermarkets who need to reduce it, or they need to be made to take it back at the end of the week, and then they'll recycle it properly. I'm an international tax accountant, and I know how certain numbers work. And we keep trying to tax people like Google and all these international companies like Starbucks, and they can get away with never paying tax their entire lives because they have an army of accountants. But if we made it a law that they had to take everything back, then then yep. they couldn't get out of it. They can't get out of physically taking it back. They can get out of paying tax, but that would effectively become the tax they pay. Yeah, and uh, where that came from for the electrical waste was the European Union, and I think it was only like 25 years ago, the European Union made legislation for all the countries that they have to recycle this stuff because it was just being thrown into landfill. So I think you really need to, you know, maybe lobby, lobby your local politician. This is probably a very bad time about it because the election's coming up. But if you can get your, to, you know, your European counterparts up there, they'll mention it up there and then hopefully some sort of law will be passed is, the, is my only advice. I, I don't know everything, but I think that would be the way to go about it. Um, mine's a bit more of a, a question or a request, but uh, listening to what you said, we learned so much today, and it's amazing. And you were saying how, you know, in the third level institutions, you're doing the bioplastics and all, and someone else suggested do people know how to then dispose of those correctly, and it's all in the education. And I think it's amazing that you're looking to educate students through art and through your background. What have you thought about trying to take it back to like primary education? Because you know, they think societal change takes a minimum of 10 years for even the most basic things. So wouldn't it be great if we could get them when they're younger? <laughs> yeah, 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 um, definitely. And, you know, the, the science gallery and that, they are doing the exhibition at the minute. I know they have to change it every year. Uh, actually, the main driving force behind the whole uh, education on green things, there's a green committee here in the college. And we have a green flag, which we got to raise by Chagas last year. So we're... We're good in that aspect. Transition year students, I give talks to them once a week. That's just part of my job in the pharmacy department, and I do the exact same talk that I've given to you. Um, I, I, I don't know, I don't have kids myself, that is, so I don't know what you know f facilities out there, but I would maybe speak to your primary teacher and go, because there's other people out there who do educate about this, but they, they have to be paid to come to your school. Do that. So I would say, lobby your local primary school teacher the next time you're in, and go, guys, can you educate them a bit, a bit more about it? Okay. 
Hi, I, um, I work in making toys eco-friendlier and so I, I see the producers of toys and I guess they're similar to other manufacturers of plastic products in that they own big factories full of injection moulding machines and staff who know how to run injection moulding machines. And I've talked to one producer that switched the same injection moulding machine from virgin plastic, you know, petroplastic pellets to recycled plastic pellets and they didn't have to buy any machine or a new factory or train new staff, they could continue with their capital, you know, because the capital cost of those factories is massive. Yep. And so I'm just, what I haven't figured out, and I wonder if you might know, is could those same injection molding machines work with bioplastic pellets? Because if the answer is yes, will convince manufacturing companies to switch so much easier than if they have to go out and buy a new injection molding machine and train, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, uh, you're quite right. The processing sheets, because I've worked in the environment for, for the biodegradable plastic, your normal plastic, are exactly the same. Uh, but the unfortunate thing is, is the 72% cost. It's still more costly to buy the biodegradable plastic in bulk than it is for the recycled plastic. That recycled plastic toy should really have a label on it and say it recycled. And a lot of eco-conscious adults like yourself would probably buy it for their kids compared to elsewhere, you know? Hi. So, uh, hi, um, thanks very much. I thought it was very interesting. Um, it was very positive as well, and I love the way you're talking about using the arts to communicate, because I, I really agree with you. Um, I think that's a very effective way. Um, I work for Intashka, so we have the, the Green Schools program, and actually the Green Schools program was with primary kids going up through secondary, and then they started Green Campus in third level. The first Green Campus in the world was UCC. Um, started by the, the Green School kids growing up through the, the years and now we've Green School, Green Campus in Trinity and UCD and all around the place. So it's just, it's another way of hope. So if, you know, if you're, if you're a parent, uh, like Green Schools is, is a great way of doing things. But Antashka also does, sorry I'm plugging now, Antashka no, also no, does, uh, uh, we also have Clean Coast. So that's a, a great community all around the country of communities, um, you know, picking up litter. And, you know, a lot of it is plastics, unfortunately, that we find, and same with National Spring Clean. And they're really, I think, very empowering ways to do something positive and get outside and connect with your community and do something nice, you know, um, against this wave of, pardon the pun, of plastics that were being dealt with. But thanks again. That was really excellent. Thank you. Thank you. One final question, and then we'll have... No, okay. I just, it was actually, I was going to say the same thing as that man from Montoshka, but is, there is the green flag for primary schools and secondary schools. My children go to a green flag school, and every year the school has to set a target. They have to achieve that target, such as walking to school, not bringing in bottles or anything like that. But um, there's also eco-UNESCO, and they do youth awards for environment issues. Okay. Um, but also, I wanted to just make the point about it's actually the parents, because they're the consumers that need to be educated yeah. about it. It's great. Like My kids can tell me anything about it, but there are the parents. They're the ones that do the shopping. They're the ones who are educating. So a program to parents' associations in green flag schools. And maybe the guy in Natushka could yeah, look yeah, into I, that I as well. Yeah, I think you're right, because when I done my diploma in art and design, I actually done my essay, thesis essay on it, on how art can capture the passerby. There's a lot of people in Trinity, who say, here, who know already that you have to recycle. Mm. But there's a lot of other people who say, maybe we weren't as lucky in their education growing exactly. up. Exactly. And they're the ones, they're the people we need to catch, just to let them know, hey, you know, just don't throw that away. If you can recycle, my, it'll be great. My generation was, mi well, I don't know, I'm in my 40s. <laughs> but, um, like, I wouldn't have learned about green issues, except for my parents would be Yeah, green but your parents supporters. probably before that probably reused every single yeah, thing they that came into the house, whereas background, nowadays but we've come in with our consumer culture and it's Exactly, it's just it's driven and marketing is so powerful, yeah, but yeah. it's parents Agree, of yeah. the current generation uh, so that it's, needs... It's education, or more importantly, yeah. probably re-education for some... Changing yeah. habits. Changing habits, yeah. yeah. One more. Um, in supermarkets, it's actually better if you go to a butcher or something like that, or um, a market. But even if you go there and bring a compostable bag or something like that, it's better if you bring your own Tupperware, like a um, tin or something, because then you aren't actually putting the waste into the ground, and you're actually reusing the stuff. Yep. So I'd advise if you go to like a butcher, bring your own 
like Tupperware box or something so that you can bring the thing home. Also, it's easier to carry if, like, also it you don't have to rip open the bag and stuff like that. You just open the tin. Perfect. We need more people like you to give advice like that. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks a million, Trevor, for that. Uh, our next show is on at four o'clock. It's a show. It's for having a, a comedy gig about the environmental crisis. Just to echo comedy. We just sort of have to stay positive in these times we're in. So please feel free to come back at four o'clock. Just ask you to clear the room. We just have a few things to get sorted out in the room. Thank you.